Hey, we're the Doctors Who Podcast. Today we'll be discussing Robert Jordan's Eye of the World prologue through Chapter 2. The prologue opens up on Luz Theron, wandering through his destroyed palace. While looking for his wife, Ilyena, a man clad in black, Elan Morin, appears confronting Luz. Luz's life is in shambles and he no longer has a legacy, being overtaken by the power of Elan. A bolt of lightning strikes Luz, presumably killing Kinslayer. Luz's palace is consumed and disappears in a fountain of lava and mountainous rock. As we get into the main portion of the book, we are introduced to Randall Thor and his father, Tam Althor, carting libations toward the village of Eamon's Field and the Beltine celebration. On the road, Rand has the feeling of being watched and a cloaked rider and horse appear. Or was it just his imagination? In town, we are introduced to Matram and Perrin, or Matt and Perrin, Rand's friends who helped unload the barrels of libations into the inn and tell of strangers in the village. As it turns out, the strangers, Moraine and Lan, are staying at the inn. Upon returning to the great room of the inn, the friends run into the Lady Moraine, who gives each boy a silver penny to assist her with mysterious tasks around town. Join us in discussing these topics and more coming right up. Welcome to the Doctors Who Podcast. My name is Chris. My name is Chip. My name is Brian. Okay, so, prologue, chapter one, chapter two. I have the world, Robert Jordan. Good stuff. Um, so, we got the lowdown from Brian, uh, and I think let's uh, let's just take a second and each of us can kind of give our quick thoughts. Uh, Chip, we'll start with you. We'll go to Brian, and then I can go. All right. So reading this for the first time in 20, 25 plus years, um, the prologue makes a lot more sense this time because I've read all of the subsequent books. So, I, you know, it kind of helps me know where it's going. But um, kind of knowing some of those elements really, it, I'm kind of reading it with a different eye this time. So there's a lot more detail that I'm looking at, um, things that I'm trying to pick up. Uh, the first two chapters, it, it really, it, it starts out slower than I remember um, because I know that there's stuff that happens, but it, it doesn't happen as soon as I thought it would. So, but it's interesting to know which characters, see which characters have been introduced even in the first two chapters. So there's some major players that um, don't seem like major players yet, but but they will be. Man, I'm going to have to say I was a little confused. So I, I started into the prologue and I was like, OK, OK, there's a lot going on here. And then I started it on chapter one. And I'm like, whoa, this is completely different. I should probably have a notebook. So then I went and got a notebook and then I reread the prologue and then I read the first chapter again. So uh, I, I, I liked it much better the second time through because I kind of got the feel of where the, the breaks were and, and I could understand kind of what, what was going on. Um, I actually like where this is starting off. Uh, again, we talked about this in our prior video, our introduction to this book, but there is a familiarity to this setting. Uh, of course, every great fantasy story has some sort of tavern scene. And, and this really is like the in the tavern, the kind of the, the comfy place you're used to. And, um, you know, I'm already starting to pick up on some of the the unusual magic in this world, if you will. Like one of my favorite parts was with the, the the raven that was kind of hanging around and it was being described as a vile bird. And like there's kind of a connection here, this magic, the sense of, of something just beginning to creep into this otherwise sleepy village. So, uh, yeah, I like it so far. So I remember the prologue being a lot longer. <laughs> it's, in reality, it's only a few pages, but it seems like, like my memory before I opened this book back up was like it was it was probably worth us spending a single one of these episodes on. But and I think that's really just because there is so much crammed into it. 
Um, we get to kind of see Luce Theron, uh, he's basically the most powerful man in the world at the time this prologue takes place, broken. Uh, we, we learn that, you know, this there's the one power and the dark one has tainted it. Um, so And it, it's driven all the men who channel the one power mad. Uh, I don't, I don't know if I picked up on that the first time I read this, but going through, I definitely could put that together. You know, you know, they launched an offensive against the Dark One. His backlash tainted the male half of the true source. Blah 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 blah. blah. Hand wavy, hand wavy. Um, so, so there's there's just a lot there, and it's hidden in such a way that if you're not looking for it, I don't know that you're gonna get it. And then when we do finally get to the two rivers, to Rand, to Matt, uh, we do see, uh, to, to Brian's point, some similarities. The Black Rider, very similar to the Nazgul. Uh, the bit with the Raven being the eyes for the Dark One. Um, that's reminiscent of Tolkien as well, when all the carrion eaters come flying by and the fellowship has to hide under stuff and things like that so uh one thing i the the depiction of the small backwater village feels very tropey to me and i don't know if that's because it truly is tropey or when this was written over 30 years ago it wasn't and people have built on it since then which makes it feel almost out of touch so yeah i think those are my thoughts all right so i kind of like all i like those takes my my thought with your point on the tropes i i can definitely see that but I'm also wondering if that's just a good commonplace for a lot of authors to write, like, the story of a long journey. Like, when I hear about a character starting in a um, kind of a backwater village, I just think, all right, well, they go from nothing to something important. So, yeah. Well, it's the uh, same thing that happens in Star Wars. It's, oh, yeah, you know, good point. It's, it is. It's the, it's the well, hero character. So, so I think that, you know, probably for Brian starting out, you've probably been spoiled on kind of who the main character of the trio is but you know the first time i read this i didn't know you know i didn't know i didn't know anything that this was about you know and there was no internet to go out and spoil me with stuff so you know i just had to read and kind of figure stuff out and like chris was saying that you know the prologue you know there's so much in there but going back and reading it again knowing where things are going it's like oh that makes sense you know because he drops a forsaken right there in the first two pages of the book and they become very important later but not knowing who that is at the time but the hint the clues aren't there it's just so i didn't know how to put them together until later and and i think uh i need to expand on what i mean by by tropey i don't necessarily mean the hero coming from nothing so much as i mean like the depiction of the villagers and like You've got oh, the men's gotcha, council gotcha. and the women's circle and the village wisdom, and you got this old cranky dude who's and the crazy. In the inn and... <laughs> you know, you've got his buddies, the big oh, yeah. troublemaker. So it's and just a... some of those constructs. Okay. I gotcha. Yeah, yeah, but I think every Dungeons and Dragons it, game yes. I ever played, we always started in some backwater yes. inn or tavern somewhere. Yeah. So, yeah. It's kind of germane to the genre, I guess. But German, but again, it it, it that's it. Kind of t- he kind of takes that trope, and then you know by the time they leave this backwater area, it's completely his own thing. You know that there's still some tropey elements to it, but he really defines his own world. True. All right, well, I'm guessing that's true. It is, <laughs> in my opinion. I'm guessing this is not a retelling of Lord of the Rings, or... No. Yeah. Um, wh- one thing I wanted to mention, uh, because in the last episode, Chip, you mentioned that there's a second prologue, and Brian, yeah, you brought this up in your, you know, your little take, was the, the raven, and, and I mentioned it too. Um, but the raven 
just behaving abnormally, right? So like Rand and Matt throw rocks at it and the thing just like sidesteps the rocks and keeps staring at them. And they get the feeling that it's like staring at them. Uh, and in that mm -hmm. second prologue that uh, Chip mentioned, there are ravens there too. Uh, Egwene, yep. who we don't See, Gwaine, meet, but yeah. we hear about in chapters one and two, is walking through, and this is like when she's nine, so it's probably nine or ten years. I think it was like five or six years is it? or okay. something prior. I think they say something. Yeah, it, like that, it said it's... she was nine years old in that, so, but anyway years ago and like she notices all these ravens and she notices that they are staring at like the men and the boys so their behavior, and their behavior is strange. strange as well yeah because like uh like this this bird like tries to chase a raven off and it just like ignores them and keeps watching people so you know yeah. creepy mm -hmm. yeah um but yeah Oh, it, I, I almost wondered if, you know, of course I have no background in this, but so far between the prologue and chapter one, we have two mentions of a presumably man clad in black. And I wondered if there was any connection between the, the horseback and rider Cash. and yes, <laughs> I, never I mean, put that together. Wow. Huh? If I see a ring of fire, I'll know for sure it's him. Well, there or, are the rings. Or Lord of the Rings again, one of the two. <laughs> but I, I wondered if it was the same guy as the, the one who showed up to lose Theron in the, the prologue. Like, I, I get the feeling so far. Uh, I've noticed a couple different things like uh, attention to colors. Colors seem to matter. Um. Just little things like the the apparel that that uh, the lady was wearing when she was at the inn giving giving the silver penny out to the trio. Uh, actually, I think there was four. I think there was a boy there too. But mm -hmm. um, anyway, she was wearing blue, for example. Like all of these little details. It's like he is very specific in the words that he chooses, yes. and it seems like words matter here. And there so might be an importance try. to color and stuff too. The other thing, and I can't remember, Chris, you're more familiar with Lord of the Rings and the timeline as to kind of when things happen. Mm -hmm. So if I recall, Fellowship really is kind of, did it kind of happen in the fall? Like, yeah, season-wise. So I think this one's kind of different because it's actually taking place after the winter. Yep. So it's kind of a springtime thing, but, but it was a late thaw and things, you know, yeah. the crops are kind of late getting into the field. So... So the timing of it is, you know, I know that there's some things that really mirror Lord of the Rings, but to yeah. me, that one stood out as a little bit different. That You know, a lot of the, what I think of as fantasy yeah. novels kind of take place in the fall, and then they have this night rebirth of this culmination in the spring when the kind of the world comes back to life and stuff. So I thought that that one was just a little bit different in this Yeah, book. so the Fellowship departs Rivendell on Christmas Day. Hmm. Um but okay. to that point, you know, in my, um, in my, well, I thought I had a map in this book, but the, the map, I don't know if we can actually see it, but it, it greatly mm -hmm. resembles Middle Earth. So I noticed that as well. So there are truly I greatly resembled to Europe too shocking <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah um, so yes a lot of parallels uh, some interesting differences Brian I, I you're right that words mean something but also Robert Jordan is going to literally describe every square millimeter of this world to us so <laughs> And I think I read that somewhere that they counted 258 unique characters in just this book. And I know oh there's gosh. more that get introduced yeah. later. Not all of those are important characters, but almost every <laughs> character has yeah. a name. Yes. Um, well, I, yeah, I was just going to say, aside from like, you know, the raven, we also have indications that other things are weird. Like they say spring is a month late. Um, 
uh, they're, tr you know, Rand and his father, Tam, are traveling to town, and, like, Rand has an arrow knocked, and he's keeping an eye out because wolves and bears have All been the, coming the in because oh, they can't yeah. get food up in the mountains, and, you know, it's been the worst winter in, his in living memory, and so right off the bat, we get a lot of just indications that something's not right. And then we see the rider, which is very reminiscent of the Nazgul. Mm -hmm. And so it's... Mm -hmm. But it's only... did So we know Rand saw it. Matt and Perrin both saw the rider too. Well, we haven't too, seen right? Perrin yet. We know ever. Matt did. We, we met him briefly. In the second chapter, we do. Yeah. Really? Yeah, because he was just like Lorraine gives in, each of them a coin. I thought it was I yeah. thought it was just was, Matt and Rand and Ewan that got the coin. He was definitely there for a short time. He was helping them unload barrels, but yeah. it was like I don't even know if he spoke at all. He just was kind of there for a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, unimportant. Yeah. Even though I'm right. No, I'm kidding. Um. Where were we going with that? My brain just turned off. Like we're just talking about how the world was yes. very yes. weird and eerie mm -hmm. and strange things are about. And I, I guess I was going back to I thought I know Rand saw the rider. I know Matt mentioned he saw a black rider. Mm -hmm. And for some reason I thought Perrin had to, but maybe that's maybe that comes up later. Sorry. I think I think it's um, later, but I don't I don't know. Um they had seen weird things around town. Yeah, yeah. Like they oh, talked about. There's a gleeman in town. There's a gleeman, which they they kept using this word. There's that word again, gleeman, gleeman. <laughs> like, is that like a bard or a yes. singer? Yes. Basically, okay. a traveling, yeah, entertainer, which is a big deal in Emmons Field because they, you know, never get the big, you know, that they never get the big entertainment. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Um, yeah. And then we're also introduced, uh, you know, we, we talked about the silver pennies. Uh, and, and I think, if I remember that correctly, they they noticed Ewan got a silver penny, but the two coins that Brandon and Matt got were different. Yep. So for some mm -hmm. reason, she gave them these coins, and Ewan just got a silver penny. Um, and I say for mm -hmm. some reason... I know why, but mm -hmm. so just something to keep your eye on there, Brian. Good to note, but but I like the introduction of Moraine and Lan. Uh, you know, we we hear about them and then we see them, and I and I like how when Moraine goes off, like Lan follows, and they're like, "Oh crap, there was a guy there." We didn't even see him. <laughs> <laughs> He's got that cool cloak that he wears that kind of helps him blend into places. Hmm. I want one. I know. Also, do you think... Do you think that might have been the inspiration for Harry's invisibility cloak? Oh. Not sure. Certainly could have been. Although, possibly, Sorcerer's Stone came out in the early '90s, didn't it? I want to say '94. So it's possible. Who knows? But that just yeah. occurred to me, so I thought I'd bring it up. Um, and and we noticed something else about Moraine. It's like you know he looks at her and he can't. Rand can't put an age to her. Um, and there's in the book it actually goes into that a little bit more. Uh, top of page 24. Wait. Maybe I made that up. And, and Harry Potter was published in 1997, just as oh, a correction. Okay. Well, I thought I had notated the page that he noticed that, but it's like he... He, uh... He's like, he's like, well, the, the eyes look like they have like all these all this wisdom and experience, even though her face looks so. It's and that's something they say throughout the yeah. book that. Yeah. So. Something interesting. Yeah, you hear about the ageless faces right. a lot, mm -hmm. almost as much as hairbraid. 
Talking. And you know this this yeah. this is pretty ageless too. So yeah, yeah. Um, one thing that get... I I kind of I think the first time I read it, I always expected Nineave. I don't know how pronunciation. I'm sure Michelle will correct oh, me there if go. there's another way to say it. But but I always thought she struck me as much older the first time I read it, and I think she's supposed to be like twenty, you know, or so years old in in this. Yeah. You know, so I always, you know, the way she treats everyone else around her, you know, just like she's very superior and in charge and kind of, you know, herds the, the younger kids around. But, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But anyway, so it's kind of, it'll be interesting kind of reading it, knowing that she's actually a lot younger than the first time I read it. I know it was in there, but I must have missed it and just kind of, I always expected her to be like mid thirties or somewhere. She seems like know. it. Closer to middle age. Um, the yeah. that second prologue you sent, uh, there was a sentence in there that mentioned that she was recently orphaned at the time that that took place. So that might account yeah. for the her being more Very mature grown and up. grown up. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, that makes sense. And then we we close this one out with you know the the peddler coming uh, and peddlers yep. are. I mean, it, it's a, it's how you would get supplies, but it's also how you get news from the outside world when you live in a small, isolated pocket. Mm-hmm. So um, I think yeah. it's safe to say in the next episode we will have more world building to discuss. More than likely. More than likely. It's a good yeah. bet. All right. Anything else we want to hit before we wrap this thing? No, I don't have any. I thank Nick for making us look good with Definitely. the new graphics. But... Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Um, okay, so <laughs> join us next time uh, as we continue on, starting with Chapter 3. Uh, I'm going to just go out on a limb and say we're going to hit Chapter 3 and Chapter 4 for the next episode so if you are reading along as we're reading along that will get you to where you need to go Uh, please if you've enjoyed this hit the like button below Uh, if you would like to follow along with some of our other content we invite you to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you get notified when we post new content we also uh, appreciate comments so tell us what you liked about this section tell us if we got anything wrong tell us what you don't like maybe this is not your cup of tea maybe you read it and you just don't like it we still want to hear about it but just be respectful and (laughs) i mean that's fair isn't it yeah um we will be posting new content on the eye of the world every week so we invite you to keep checking back thank you for watching and until next time how long z